I am a poor, wayfaring stranger Traveling through this world alone And we're live! Hello and welcome to a bonus episode of the First Time Watchers Podcast. Back to the front! Because uh, we like to watch. My name is Tim Costa. This is Walter Vinci. And uh, those crickets you hear is the sound of Hermano da Silva riding a cloud of mustard gas into the great beyond. But joining us tonight from FilmSeekers.com, the man whose long takes are the best long takes, Neil Ramji. Welcome back, Neil. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. How are you both? Excellent. Do you know what? Even though Hermano is not with us tonight, he did say this to me. Hey, Neil. So, come on. <laughs> you guys missed out. You guys missed out. Brilliant. Uh, anything you want to plug before we get into it, Neil? Uh, no, if anyone wants to follow me uh, by the end of my rant today, uh, you can always add me on Twitter at FilmSeekers. Uh, all right, excellent. Uh, moving on, what we usually do on the FTW podcast is find a movie that none of us have seen, watch together, and then discuss. However, in this bonus episode, we'll be discussing the latest Sam Mendes film, 1917. Did you hear that story about Wilco? How he lost his ear? Not in the mood. Keep your eyes on the trees, top of the ridge. Bet he told you it was shrapnel. What was it then? Well, you know his girl's a hairdresser, right? And he was moaning about the lack of bathing facilities when he wrote to her. Remember those rancid jakes, Harris? Yeah. Anyway, she sends him over this hair oil. <laughs> Smells sweet. Like golden syrup. Wilco... Loves the smell, but he doesn't want to cast it around in his pack. So, he slathers it all over his barnet, and goes to sleep. And in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and a rat is sitting on his shoulder, licking the oil off his head. <laughs> Wilco panics, and he jumps up, and when he does, the rat bites clean through his knee and runs off with it. No. And just to warn people ahead of time, this will be a spoiler-filled discussion. So beware. The plot, two young British soldiers during the First World War are given an impossible mission. Deliver a message deep in enemy territory that will stop 1,600 men and one of the soldiers' brothers from walking straight in to a deadly trap. The director, Sam Mendes, the actors, Dean Charles Chapman, George McKay, uh, Daniel Mays, and lots of extras. Lots and lots of extras. Uh, Neil. Neil. Oh, hello, uh, what, what, Tim. What did you uh, What did you think of this uh, of this film? Okay, so I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background here. Um, I saw this on Friday nights at my local Odeon, my local cinema, um, and the kind of background I have to give you is kind of like where I live and why that's important to this film. So I, I live in Salisbury, which you may have heard of in the past year or so. It is on the south coast of England. And its recent claim to fame was that it was the centre of this uh, poisoning of a Russian secret agent, allegedly by Putin's minions. Mm. Um, it also has an insubordinate amount of army bases nearby. So this film is quite close to home for a lot of people, young and old. Um, and there are great parades for, you know, the, the dead soldiers who return from the legacy of Blair and Bush's oil wars. So, you know, you see them come back. But I'm, I, I'm a pacifist as well. So I always find that uh, war is kind of futile in the end of it. And films that glamorize war and even fetishize it uh, are more than distasteful. And I think that 1917 often falls into that throughout the film. Um, and even now I'm starting to forget large chunks of it. So for me, it wasn't that memorable it was more of a technical achievement than a cohesive film as a whole so those are my sort of initial thoughts on it hmm. okay uh neil you could say war what is it good for absolutely nothing <laughs> uh wally all right so i had a lot of excitement going into this uh this movie um and i am Fresh out of the theater, literally only uh, just got back home about an hour ago before we started recording. And uh, I fancy myself a bit of a war historian. Uh, I like doing like deep dives and like what was going on politically, what was going on on the home front. 
um, you know, uh, accounts from the people who were on the lines at the time. I like to go into the whole historical aspect of it. So I was kind of hoping for to see just how close uh, this movie got to any sort of actual historical accuracy on it versus something like uh, They Shall Not Grow Old, which is, I mean, granted, they're two different things. This is more uh, story based than The Shall Not Grow Old is more of a, of a, of a uh, you know, a documentary. And this, I don't know, it feels. For for such a, a such a, a a big period of history, this, this movie feels a little flat to me, and I th- think it's because we're following just one soldier around, um, and it moves very quickly. Like this, you know, it's a two-hour movie, and it it just kind of speeds through things. I think, and I think that that's to its detriment. Uh, well, I'm probably, I'm definitely going to be the most positive on this because, you know, you two have talked about your biases going into a movie like this, and I have a bias. I have a bias, a soft spot for war films. I have a soft spot for films that depict heroic sacrifice and, and heroic determination. And this movie taps right into those soft spots of mine. Uh, so I'm like the Pillsbury Doughboy throughout this whole movie going, hoo hoo And, um, yeah, so it, it's... It's a technical marvel. There's no denying how technically brilliant this movie is. And a lot of it reminded me of Dunkirk from a couple of years ago in terms of its uh, technical virtuosity and, and, its, and showcasing uh, the achievements uh, a filmmaker or uh, a filmmaker with a cinematographer, in this case, can show us when... I, like I can't even imagine the storyboarding that went into this movie. Uh, it, it must have been a grueling process, not just in the storyboarding but the rehearsals uh, to pull this off. And yes, I I fully recognize that there are, are seams, despite the cut the right in directly smack in the middle of this movie. There, uh, throughout the first and the second half, there are seams you could probably point out. But beyond that, it's it's a brilliantly executed film uh and i will say that for sure yeah there's few films that make me want to learn everything about how they're made movies like titanic and gravity are among those and i think this falls under that category as much as people and i am praising roger deacon's cinematography uh i think it may be one of his more subdued looking films it's just the the way it's executed uh, not the long takes, but how we're always with the main characters for almost the entire runtime. Their faces Mm -hmm. or bodies fill the frame for very long periods of time. And we see their perspective of the immediate foreground. And there's very, very little of the horizon that we see. Uh, We never know what's around the corner, what's up ahead in the road or just over that hill. And it's, it's a brilliant technique because it, it adds to that sense of tension and claustrophobia, along with the increased uh, score uh, at the right times. So, you know, it there is a bit of manipulation there in terms of the score. I recognize that, but I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm I was just kind of floored by this movie. Uh, and if there's anything to fault, it may be that those long takes can remove us from that those emotional moments. It, some of it reminded me of this movie from a few years ago called Victoria. Yeah, I've got that written down here. So, like, I think it owes a massive debt to Victoria. In fact, I think Victoria is probably a better technical achievement than this film because Victoria wasn't necessarily billed as one take, but it is actually one take, whereas this is clearly not. I'm not sure it's a a better technical achievement. I give them credit for building a a two-plus-hour movie in Victoria on one take, uh, but there, there is a moment in that that forces us to believe an emotional moment that may feel a little bit unearned due to the actual amount of time spent with those people in Victoria. Whereas 1917, I think, earns a little bit more just due to the war setting and the environment. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to respectfully disagree with you on this point. And, I, and I'll just I'll, I'll tell you why I'm interrupting. Because in, in terms of Victoria, I felt like there was a 
there was a gripping story behind it that I didn't know where it was going, you know, um, and that's what took me along for the ride. These were new characters in a, an, an alienish setting that I had no affinity to or no no background to. And in 1917, throughout the film, it seems to lack that the, the sort of jeopardy that I would like to have seen in the film where certain events happen. And it's a no doubt when you get to the end of the film where it will end up. That's where fair. It did. That's that's very fair. And honestly, if there's a movie that I wish I did not see a trailer to, this would have been it. Because it, one of the highlights of the end of the trailer is him running along the side of that trench uh, and with the explosions around him. And that's at the end of the movie. And you're like, OK. Because mm-hmm. so throughout the movie, I, I, I'm th- there are times when I'm not... Uh, you know, completely engaged in terms of, of whether or not this particular character is going to make it or not, because I've already seen the trailer and I've noticed, I know that there's still that scene remaining, (laughs) you know, he has to get there. So, uh, and the the big, the big set piece is also spoiled in the trailer with, with the plane because there are no other planes in the film. Right. And that is spoiled in the trailer in itself. You know, what's going to happen to that plane if you've seen the trailer. And, and, and I guess, I guess the other thing kind of the, with this one take sort of element to it, not only did it remind me of Victoria, it reminded me of the Revenant in large chunks of it, actually, mm, interesting. where you are following just this solitary character um, for large parts of it. And, you know, the, the, the story does become a, a one person's, um, heroic strive to to get this message to the other side, and it, it kind of felt like um, in Aritu's work with the Revenant at times. And I, I, I get, I, 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 do you know what? It it also gave me a very very weird feeling throughout of this film. It felt like I was watching someone else play a video game. That's how it felt to me. And you know those kind of third person games yeah. where the camera sits over the shoulder of your character and you go around sneaking about your business, doing whatever. Yeah. You interact with characters, you have a dialogue, and then you move on. And in the angle of the camera might twitch when there's a cut scene or a big action set piece. Yep. And then you have to press a button at the right time when 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 the action set piece happens. And it quite often felt like that. And I, I don't want really want for me, I don't want my films to be boiled down to that especially when it comes to something as uh, as important as war which i don't think should be taken lightly and i don't think it does take take it lightly but i i want something a bit more than than a script that could have been written for something like a medal of honor game and, and technically you're right i can't fault it deacons is doing his thing there's a nice reference to the blade runners orange mist in there as among other other works that deacons has done uh, mendes can do action set pieces in his sleep and thomas newman's sort of like zimmer like score that all that that whole stuff that all works that really really works well and the acting um george mckay as the the lead chap in it he, with his little scared rabbit eyes he's a great actor and and he hit and and to hit those marks and and deliver the lines in the film uh, must have been a real study for all the actors concerned because um, if you haven't tread the boards in the theatre, you're not going to be used to this length of cuts in the film world. And so it, from that perspective and from an acting perspective, it must have been so difficult to, right, you've got to be land exactly there and deliver this line there because the camera the camera will twitch and, and move on and, 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 and all that. So, so for, I, I, I won't take anything away from the technical side of things because it must have been, like I said, very, very difficult to pull off. I just don't feel that narratively which I think is a, la- a half of a film to me, you know, it's, it's the visuals and, and the sound and everything. And if it's telling me a story, the narrative also has to work. And I just felt like nothing by the end of it because I knew where it was going to end up. And I was just, I don't care. I knew this was going to end up. I didn't feel sentimental about it. And it just, it tries to wring a few tears at the end and, and, you know, tries to go, you know, died and died on the field in England. Look at all these boys that are fighting for the new world against the, the Nazis. And it, just did absolutely nothing for me. Hmm. Uh, Wally, do you feel as strongly as Neil? Yeah, I pretty much do, actually. I think Neil and I are on, this, on the same page here. I mean, like, technically, I can't fault this movie at all. I think visually, um, this movie is gorgeous. But the way this movie is, the, the, the overall story, and that's the first thing I want you to, to tell me about. Like, tell me, a, tell me a story. Even if it's loosely based on historical events. In this case, it's Operation Alberic, uh, where the Germans were retreating back to the Hindenburg line to create a flexible defense toward the end of the war once they knew the... They saw the writing on the wall that they weren't going to be able to continue the the battles any further, so they pulled back to be able to uh, catch uh, any offensives coming in 
in these insano cross uh, crossfires, and it worked for a while until the the uh, the Entente figured it out. But in in this, it I realize we're being told that there are there are sixteen hundred people that are going to go over the top, and if this message doesn't get there, it's they're they're all going to die. They're going to fall victim to this flexible defense. They're going to get killed unless he can get to the the general and general mckenzie and and get the message to him but like the whole time there's no stakes tim like i know you like to talk about stakes i didn't feel any stakes like we're just moving along (laughs) the stakes are things are happening there's the the stakes are always there they're always present he has to deliver the message yeah he has to deliver the message but the way this movie is paced and in him getting from point a to point b there's weird deuce ex machina moments in here deuce like when, especially when his his buddy gets killed at the beginning, <laughs> it's just him and it's just him and it's him and his buddy, and then all of a sudden, uh, the uh, officer shows up with a couple other guys. I'm like, where the fuck were you when I needed you? Like you guys had to have seen all this. What was going on? This is because this, clearly this is... we're walking the camera through. Everyone's taking a piss along the side of the freaking barn, so you saw something. Look, this is not the first time I've seen a war film. See, a Saving Private Ryan is one that comes to mind, uh, and th- there are others where people are traveling a, a good distance, and and they just happen to come upon a group of people or another person with, where they could have used their assistance or or something of that that nature. Uh, so I, I was never really taken aback at that that point, to be honest with you. To me, it took it took me out of the out of the just the sheer tension of it all. You know what I mean? Like it just people just popping up out of the blue, um, and, and some of the stuff like even even really felt forced too. Like you know when he's he's at the uh, you know uh, the burning city, the the city's on fire, um, which wasn't on fire earlier, but now is. Um, and he finds the, you know the the one French woman and the baby you know hiding out um, you know in you know that he he finds finds a friend amongst all the the you know the craziness of war like that just felt so tropey and, and and shoehorned in that I didn't even know why it was why it was there you know and same thing later on when he's engaging some of the the holdover German troops that are covering the retreat. Uh, throughout the burning city, which is I don't know why they would stay in a burning city, um, but like that could have been played for more tension, and it it just it just isn't. So like, oh, he's gonna get eventually he's gonna get discovered because like they're struggling on the floor here, and th- yeah, I know the co- the his the the partner of the German soldier is drunk, but I know where this is going. Like it's it just seemed. Okay, let's take, let's get to the next the next story beat. Let's get to the next story beat. Let's get to the next story beat. You know, like let's keep this moving along so we can get to our our big running scene at the end. See, I I didn't uh, feel that way during that moment that you talked about with the drunk uh, soldier because I, I I was curious as to what was going to happen. I felt like oh, they're enough in the shadows that he's going to uh, stumble over and and. Uh, and this, yeah, this goes back to the whole video game aspect. It really felt like you were going for a stealth section of this video game at that point, and 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 you know you had to try you you were like Tomb Raider or something. I don't know, just kind of hiding in the shadows, trying to get out to to an exit point. And it's a good job he picked up the milk from the cow in the first place because he'll need that on his quest halfway through to the baby well, at some I point. Wanna, and it, and it, and it's particularly a little subtitle that says, you picked up the milk. Oh, but that's see, exactly what it is, though. That is that's exactly a, that's how shame. basic this storyline is. See, that's and a it's shame very, be- very video gamey. Because I found that moment of the milk very uh, rich in symbolism because milk is a, is a, is a symbol of life and, and uh, nourishment. And, and so he he's the first one to take the milk at that point. And at that point, at that moment, I, I thought to myself, th- this means something in that he is the one that's going to continue on to live. And and so I, I just love that moment of symbolism right there where where he is is nourishing life into himself and literally is uh, going to make it to the end of this movie or the end of this uh, journey, I should say. And and ha- yes, having that with him for the baby uh, makes complete uh, sense to me so I, I had no problem with that at all uh, because it was much more symbolic to me than anything else 
Uh, so I, I don't know. Um, the, the, I honestly, I have very little wrong to say about this movie because I think it, it also earns much of its emotions uh, that that you guys are deriding. Once again, a lot of it has to do with the way that their their bodies and their their faces are framed throughout the entirety of this movie. So we're always on guard with them. Uh, so I, I think the 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 parts where you uh, don't like regarding you know moments of tension just going from one set piece to the other it, to me it's always what's around the other corner and uh what's going to happen next and i am I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry you guys felt this way it's it's really a shame to be honest with you it is because i really i really wanted to this have this like blow me away mm-hmm. and have it hit me like they shall not grow old hit me which i i love that documentary and i will have to get my hands on it once uh I have a little free up cash. Um, and I really had such high hopes going into this film that it, it just felt like it felt – I felt like there was enough attention to detail paid in certain areas too that really kind of threw me off watching it. Like when you first see our two characters are out in the field taking a nap. So they'd be at least at the third line or beyond that in the uh, the staging area because you'd have your staging area or your supply line – your reinforcements line and your main line, and it would be they're, they're spaced far enough apart that you wouldn't just get up and just walk right in like oh here we are at the front, you know what I mean? It, it was stuff like that, like geographical spaces, like the way this the way this movie is shot, like the the geography just oh, seems it, really it's like, it's far a too movie. Compressed. You do you do have to take uh, some liberties and suspension of of disbelief regarding a movie. It, it's, it's I a do, film. but I think I think this one take. Bit, I think is part of the problem that yeah. with all like the, the switches and the moves as we're going along, trying to get from point A to point B, that it really compresses the feeling of physical distance. Hmm. I agree. And I, I feel like some of the, you know, it's very contrived the way it tries to hit the next beat as well. Um, oh, he falls into the river and gets washed downstream very revenantly, actually, um, when I think about it. Um, and, and, and just these things that, happened to happen to this one soldier in sequence after sequence after sequence and in very quick succession because this was all in the space of what a day two days you had to get to the line before the men went over it's 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 probably it was supposed to be a couple hours but there's the i I will say that the the one moment that took me out because of the technique of this movie is the hard cut in the middle of the movie where there's about 10 seconds of black screen and and if you're constructing a movie the way you are, that moment is very jarring to me. So if, if there's any fault with the, with the way this movie is constructed or edited, if you will, it's that moment right there because that is the, the one that takes me out of it personally. And so that time period right there is probably a few hours where he's, he's knocked out unconscious. Uh, cause it, and you especially see it in the terms of the daylight to nighttime or very early morning, I should say. It, it, it's used so the, the computer can load the next scene, you oh, see, geez. so it gives it enough time. Oh, yeah. um, but, but you know what's weird is this film, uh, we're talking on the eve of the Oscar nominations, which come out tomorrow, probably gets, uh, it will probably get a um, nomination for Best Film Editing, uh, which it won't deserve one bit because there is barely any editing in it. That, you really uh, think it will get and, an editing? And it's pretty award. obvious where it's done. That, that, well, that would seem odd to me that it would get an editing nomination. I think Sam Mendes definitely deserves uh, an, a nomination for his directing because the directing of this is astounding to me because it is a technical achievement and, and you, you have to mm. take that into consideration. I, I mean, I, I'm praising its technical virtuosity uh, nonstop here, but I think it also works on a film level, on, on an emotional level. Uh, on a character level. I mean, I understand you're not the first person to, to make this comparison to a video game that, that I've seen. Uh, and, and it's hard for me to, uh, to, you know, discredit somebody's interpretation of that and how they, they view it that way. Because, you know, when whoa, you're pre- whoa, hang on, hang on. Someone else has made the same assertion as I have, that it looks like a video. I'm not on social media anymore, as you know, but it is people have compared it to a computer game as well oh they? very much so yeah you're oh, right, you're okay. definitely not the the only one it's it's um so i'll say uh, sean gilman uh, has a, a one star review on letterbox where 
he he says a steady cam is not a personality, but if you want to see an actually really cool cool long take, watch Long Day's Journey into Night, which does everything Ooh. this this does, but with vastly fewer resources, geographic and temporal consistency, and an infinitely more creatively and deeply felt script. It, see, I, I don't know. I, it loses me there when it says a deeply felt script, because I think the script of this is is completely earned. And, and one thing I really like about this movie is is the change of pace from tension to quietness. And we also spend time with a lot of other soldiers and get a sense of their viewpoint, of their look on the war, of their look at this moment in their lives. And but do you get any other perspective apart from the main character who you're following? I don't think so. Well, you're getting them when he's with them, like in the truck, for example, but, they get stuck in the mud. Y- you know, hmm. the, these, these soldiers are making the best out of the moment. And, and you can see he's stuck in the middle of these soldiers who are conversing, like nothing is happening. Like there's no, they have no idea of the dire stakes that he uh, has been tasked with. So, so when the, the truck gets stuck in the mud and you see a few soldiers help him, but others just straggle off to the side, smoking a cigarette, looking in the distance. And it isn't until that he urges them again to help. And, and they see the look on his face that, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to help this guy. I, I, I just, I just think that's really well done. Well, I, I just think that that perspective is just lens through that main character. So we don't actually get to the, the problem is, is that for me, the, 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 the this main character is so vanilla and so boring that I don't really care by the end of the film whether he gets to the line with the message or not. He's there's nothing about him. He he could be any soldier. There's there's, there's really no backstory. There's no there's no there is probably a backstory, but it's very it's thin gruel as they say. It's very very thin, and that's that's the problem. There's not enough depth of character for me to invest in him. To, to, to all I know is that he's got a very important message stop a lot of people getting killed that he needs to deliver but I don't know anything other than he is just another soldier and perhaps that's 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 the point that Mendes and um uh, the script writer the other script writer is making is that you know all these men are anonymous people who died for a cause um you know uh, by more and pow- uh, more powerful men in charge uh, maybe that is the point that's being made I think there's a brilliant moment where he stops uh, with his comrade and and says he how he doesn't like going back home because he knows that he has to leave again and that that yeah. look on his face and that moment of of emotionality is is strong to me because it's it's believable it's 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 it, it makes sense it makes sense that he wouldn't want to put him or his family through those moments of separation again it, it, in a in a film like this depicting the horrors of war. It, Sure. Yes. <laughs> but you don't even find out that he has a family until the very, very last, you know, um, reel of the film. Well, just you don't the, have you don't have that with you. You don't have that sense of he has a stake, a stake to lose throughout this film until the very end when you actually find out and you go, well, the film's done now. So I don't you know that that emotion is not there that he's got to get back to his family. By that time, you see where he's been holding those those photos have been literally close to his heart and and mm-hmm. with that moment prior that I just described I it it worked for me it worked for me did it, what about you Wally any of that work for you yeah it and it was so hard to connect to like just a lot of what was going on um like like what Neil was saying just the depth the, this movie's lacking depth it's just going to grandma's house <laughs> grandma's house it really is we're just going to grandma's house wow that's you know, that's um, rough i mean a few things caught the audience by surprise like um when but it's also given away in the trailer too where he's on the sunken bridge and the sniper is is shooting at him mm-hmm. you know what i mean and then like the one thing I, I really wanted clarification on is he opens the door the sniper sh- is waiting there for him shoots him he mm. goes back down the stairs and wakes up. Okay. No apparent wounds outside the outside the one in the back of his head. Okay. He is, he was concussed like, severely. How, how, how did he survive getting shot? I think it, I think it I think it clipped his ear. Yeah, something. I think like there's that. a little bit of blood. Okay, like, I can live with that. Like yeah. same thing with like the Germans being really terrible shots like at any other times during this movie too. Like when he's like <laughs> staring down the guy in the burning city. 
and the guy just runs at him, is shooting clearly at his back or at, directly in front of him, and he's not able to hit the side of a barn if he tried. Okay. It just, it just that. I mean, those parts right there felt so hackneyed to me. It, it, it really bothered me. Hmm. Like the shots are just like, I mean, like not just like barely over, like way the fuck wide. Like just to get the, the say on the spark off of like the metal bits in the scenery. Uh, Neil, is there anything last things you want to mention before we get into grades? Yeah, I just want to say that I actually quite like the other uh, main actor that you do have for some of the journey, and that is um, Dean Charles Chapman, who played Tom and Baratheon in um, Game of Thrones, who jumped out of the window and killed himself. Um, oh, wow. Really? I, I, I thought he was pretty good as the other lad in the film. Um, and, and, and that camaraderie gave George Mackay's character some sort of at least perspective up until a point and then you just lose it and if that carried on a little bit more rather than that character being lost so early on in the film uh, i think it was quite early on within the first maybe half an hour or so um i, I think perhaps I'm, i might have been a little bit more lenient on 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 the narrative side of things but uh, the fact that he he goes so early i, I just feel that you lose you lo- because he's got no one to talk to really apart from like meeting new people but when you when he's talking to his friend in in the trenches you know that he doesn't need to establish who he is and introduce himself and do all these other things so you can get a bit more out of him whereas you don't really get that as he goes through the film so i did like dean charles chapman for the small amount of time that he was in it he was very good uh, I will say that the the senior officer that he runs to towards the end of the movie before he gets to benedict cumberbatch is it, who is you know, crying, is <laughs> whimpering. It, that, that made me roll my eyes a little bit. I don't know if it was in terms of, I, I honestly can't tell the way I reacted was because of the moment itself and how he needed to get this message delivered or whether or not that actor who's whimpering wasn't that believable. <laughs> I, I don't know how I feel about that moment uh, or, or how uh, tropey it is, it, you know, to have a, mm. uh, but it, I don't know. Maybe I would have preferred a a more low level officer being the one seen whimpering in that manner, mm. but I don't know. The other thing too is like knowing what I knew, what I know is like that officer sitting there crying, you know, while he's supposed to go over the top. He would have just been shot. Sure, they would have just shot him. Because huh. you... that would have that would have been an act of cowardice. That's mm. demoralizing. The British expedition of horse are not cowards, and that would not be tolerated. Hmm. You think so? You think that would have really happened? It absolutely happened. Hmm. There's there's accounts of it happening. Like I'm not going over the top. Okay, bye. That's it. Well, another thing I really like is the details of showing how much the German forces are destroying. Like they destroy their own uh, machinery and artillery. They destroy. Uh, cows and and farm animals and farms as they retreat Uh, and so that level of detail is pretty interesting to me I don't know it makes sense because they don't they're trying to deny at this point they're just trying to slow the entente down they they they're running out of resources back home they they are trying to find a way to draw them into hopefully exercise some sort of victory by denying them resources maybe you pull them further into the line and then you can unleash your uh your defensive surprise. So I'm possibly the best position to, to talk about this, but um, people of color within in the war kind of always takes me aback when we when I see British period films with people of color in them, because quite often are not. So um, you get a tax break or a, some sort of um, um, subsidy uh, for in, uh, including um, uh, people of Black, Asian, or mixed ethnic uh, minorities. Uh, within your film um, to, to to be more inclusive, and I'm just just questioned because there are a few black officers um, that I, I I'm not sure. What, while you, I'm defer to your better knowledge on this, but I'm not sure how historically accurate. I know that there was a Sikh character, and I'm def- uh, I've spoken to some of the uh, the bouncers uh, at where I DJ at, and and they were yeah, there, there was obviously a a Sikh battalion that that fought alongside the British. Um, quite, I think it's well documented. They uh, did, but world. that was in that was in the. The the African campaign that was not really as I as from what I know from what I've read this so this is if there's someone out there who's got more information than I do on this I would imagine then by all means it, correct it's, me it's it's possible it's possible yeah. that uh, one or, or a a handful of soldiers who were on the African campaign maybe lent a hand in the British or the French campaign 
Oh yeah, that's certainly possible. But for the ma- the majority of them were in were in the desert fighting the Ottomans at Gallipoli and in that particular front right there. The uh, uh, I forget, I'm trying to remember what the name of the front was called, but it, when they were facing the Ottomans, it was the the Sikhs were stalwart allies of the of the British going in. And uh, there's a, a, a number of uh, great heroics that they uh, that they accomplished while while fighting those battles. Hmm. But it, it just it did seem more like a nod than anything else. I don't know how many of those Sikh regiments made their way up toward the European theater. Hmm. Um, it just, it just the seems Western front. it seems weird that there was just one Sikh on his own within another battalion. So that that kind of was yeah. a bit weird. Surely he would have been with other Sikh people as well, not just a token Sikh person. So that that kind of that's that struck me as as weird. And I, I just think at the time, in terms of race relations and and the, the British Empire, as it were, and the Commonwealth, um, that I just don't think that there would have been any black soldiers at all fighting on behalf of the war effort. Uh, certainly that far, um, that far east, I guess. Um, they- but West, they may sorry. not necessarily be British uh, 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 black community members from Britain, because up until this point, the United States was just getting ready to go into the war and were allowing certain groups of soldiers to be able to go over and fight to help out the British before they committed their troops to the fight toward the end of 1917. Right. So, so it could be it could be historically accurate is that what you're saying Wally? it could it, it, there there is potential to be some there there is potential for some historical accuracy there that could be a borrowed american soldier um uh-huh. that would be fighting with the british expeditionary force but as far as i understood they fought mostly with the french um right okay all right nerds uh let's get into grades neil <laughs> Um, I will on technically technical merit alone i will have to give this film a fairly solid b yeah uh, this movie's an A for me. <laughs> I found extremely little to to fault with it, uh, and I, it, and what I do, I can completely uh, uh, overlook because of everything else. So A for me, Wally. I give it a C plus. Hmm. Uh, I think that visually and technically, this movie is pretty awesome. I like the the camera movements. I like how everything looks, but overall, this it just left me flat. Like I didn't have any real emotional like <gasps> oh. Oh, oh no! Like none of that. Uh, Neil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. If you want to repeat where people can find you online, yep. So people can uh, find me uh, by looking on filmseekers.com. Uh, or you can also join me and add me on Twitter at filmseekers, or look us up on Instagram. We are filmseekers on there, and also on facebook.com forward slash. Film seekers, we try and talk about films that are left of centre, uh, something to help people explore new avenues of films that they haven't uh, tried before because they might have found it a bit pretentious, etc. So we're not chasing the blockbuster films all the time. Uh, we're just trying to open up some doors for people uh, to explore something a bit different. Excellent. Uh, all right, that does it for this bonus episode of the First Time Watchers podcast. Download our episodes on uh, Apple Podcasts and feel free to leave a review because we love feedback. And stay tuned for our next episode. We'll probably be discussing something very interesting. That's the first time watch this podcast because we like to watch. And there's no sickness to heal or danger in that bright line to which I go. And I'm going there to see my mother. And I'm going there. I'm only going over Jordan And I'm only going